Okay, cool. So when we're thinking about our nerve blocks for our pelvic limb um, and our epidurals, we're thinking about our, the pelvic limb innovation can range from L3, L4 right down to S1. And also abdominal wall, the main areas of innovation are T11 to L3 if we're thinking about doing an epidural for abdominal surgery. We're aiming to obviously coat the nerve roots with our local anaesthetics if we're doing um, an epidural. And we can actually do what we call a high epidural for thoracic analgesia as well. What we know as far as local uh, analgesic effects spreading forwards, what's actually more important is rather volume of drug. It's just it's the mass of drug you use. So whereas normally for a pelvic limb procedure, we would use 0.1 mg per kg of morphine as our dose of, of opioid, if you increase that to 0.2 mg per kg, you're increasing the mass of drug, you get a much more cranial spread with that. And so that's something we'll do. If we have to do a thoracotomy, then I'll do an epidural with morphine to provide that, that effect, um, which is slightly longer in onset because it's got further to spread, but by the time the dog comes out of theatre, then it's got the analgesia from that high thoracic epidural. And that's performing the epidural at exactly the same place. That's a, a lumbar sacral epidural. So landmarks wise, we have the dorsal wing of the ilium, the iliac crest here, we've got L7 and the sacrum. We're either going in this nice big space here or you can go between L6, L7 as well. I mean, you can go further forward if you like, but um, it, can, it can be a, a not so easy to get into. Indications for epidurals, analgesia for the hind limb, perineal, caudal abdominal, and I said thoracotomy as well. So widespread indications. And if we look at this schematic and where we're placing our needle, at the level we're going in here, L7 and the sacrum, we're not going to hit CSF. This diagram, I actually redrew re it since the diagram in your notes, because the diagram in the notes shows the spinal cord ending a lot further back, and it doesn't. You're very unlikely to hit CSF if you, if you go in L7 and the sacrum. So this is your epidural space here. That's where you're aiming to deposit the drug. If you do want to do a spinal injection, a spinal or intrathecal, then you're aiming to get in this space here and actually get a CSF before you inject your drug. And obviously you've got the spinal cord here. Um, as far as landmark uh, feeling your way through, you feel, when you place the needle, you feel it going through the tissues here, and then it's the ligamentum flavin that just gives a, a bit of a pop. You get no resistance, no resistance, no resistance, and then you feel a bit of resistance, and then the needle just pops through. Uh, that's the old diagram. Um, looking at it transversely, so on the floor of the canal, you've got these venous plexuses, so if you do go in back here, if you go right down to here, there are venous plexuses that you can hit. And if you do get blood, that's generally the source of the bleeding. Um, but that's no massive disaster. But you can see your needle come in and you're spreading your local all around the epidural space and it's coating the nerve roots here. Okay. And then soaking in and having a spinal action. So as far as equipment to use, we need some spinal or quinky needles. Um, we have our drugs. I use a sterile um, <coughs> pod of saline for a test injectate, appropriate syringes and sterile gloves. So these are three different sizes of needles. That is three inches long, that's two inches, and that's just over an inch, that's an inch and a half needle. And these are all 22 gauge. I think actually 22 gauge works for most of the patients we deal with. You can get a yellow needle, which is slightly thicker, but I don't often use that. I think a 22 gauge, if you had those three needle sizes in the practice, then you can do everything thrown at us. So sternal or lateral, as I said before, this is the, the um, dog with a femoral fracture that I described. She's quite fat. I'm really struggling to feel her landmarks there. Um, this is how I position the dogs in stir in, when they're in sternal with their legs pulled forward so it just opens up that L7 um, sacral interspace. 
That's her femoral. She was a guide. It's really cute, actually. She was a guide dog, and she was just walking along with her owner, and a wall fell on her and broke her leg. It was really horrible, but she did really well. So. <laughs> it's really sad. Um, so this is a dog in sternal recumbency. I've got a drape on the patient. I do tend to use drapes when I'm performing the epidurals, but I haven't here for the benefit of the photo. And the dog's head is up here, and with the, the person's left hand, they're just feeling the iliac crest there, and then you just drop off the back of L7, and you just get this depression, which is the landmark you're going for here, okay? And you want to try and stay in the midline at all times, so what I normally do with my left hand is just feel the dorsal spinal processes to make sure I know that I'm in the midline. And what I sometimes do is just put the fold of the drape along the dorsal spinous processes, because that helps um, identify landmarks. So we want to know that we're actually in the epidural space. And the technique that I use is called the hanging drop technique, whereby you put the needle in, you take the stylet out, and then you apply a drop of saline to the hub of the needle. Now, as you're advancing the needle, when you pop through the ligament and flavum, because the epidural space is under negative pressure, that drop should be sucked in out of the hub of your needle. That works in 80% of dogs in sternal recumbency. We don't know in cats, it works sometimes in cats, but it's less reliable as an indicator in cats. What some people then do, I, I don't tend to aspirate once I've got placement. Some people aspirate and check they've got, not got CSF, but normally I find if you hit CSF, it comes out of the needle. So once you've had that pop, you've done your hang and drop, just wait for a second, watch to see if any CSF issues from the needle. You can then, or actually, one of the things you can then do is take an injection of saline and just check how much resistance there is when you try to inject that test of saline. And there should really be no resistance at all. So that's what we would call a lack of resistance test. There is another test called a loss of resistance, and that's where you use a really low friction syringe. And as you're advancing your needle through the subcut tissues, you have a, this syringe connected and you're applying pressure to that. And then when it pops through the ligament and flavum, you then get loss of resistance. That's what the loss of resistance technique is. Um, there are several techniques of doing this. Choose how you do it. So this is a little video of a hanging drop and lack of resistance. So you can You can see the way I'm moving the needle just to locate the right place to be in. And you're only going through subcut tissues here, so don't be too afraid. There you go, it just pops in there. If you look really closely, you can just about see that drop sucking in, but then I'll put another drop in. Sorry, you probably get a bit of seasickness with this. Can you just see that disappearing? Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> Perfect. And I'll show you the cat video, but it's not so easy to see. It's a little bit dark, this video. So again, the cat's external recumbency. You're just putting your needle in perpendicular to the skin, taking the stylet out adding a drop of saline. I will move my hands out of the way in a second. Just feeling your way in there. And then you can just see the change in the shadows there as that um, hanging drop works, but I wouldn't, sometimes it happens in cats, but don't look, don't rely on it. If you feel like you're in the right place and you have no resistance to injection, then I would go ahead and administer your solution. So once we've verified placement, you can aspirate. If you get blood, then you should abandon that technique because you've got active bleeding and you could well inject, if you're injecting bupivacaine, you, that could go systemically. If you were using just morphine, you can still carry on, it doesn't really matter. Some of it will stay epidurally, some of it will be absorbed systemically, so, but it doesn't really matter. 
CSF, you can decide whether you're going to continue with that injection and convert it to what's called a spinal, in which case you maybe want to administer a quarter of your dose. Or you can, if you get CSF, you can just back your needle out a little bit until you stop getting CSF issued, and then you could administer your dose that you've already calculated. We know that if you inject too rapidly, that you can potentially, because of the changes in pressure that you get in the CSF, even though you're injecting epidurally, you still influence the CSF pressures. Um, people have reported bradycardia and asystole from injections when it's too rapid. So I always inject slowly over about 30 to 60 seconds. Um, we also have an ECG hooked up, so I watch the ECG, but I would suggest having somebody palpating a pulse or with an esophageal stethoscope, just so they're monitoring that patient whilst you're administering the injection. Um, it's not something I've ever seen. It has been reported. I've never seen it, though. Um, you're talking about pain, then. Like, what, what, like, I mean, you all set up for surgery. Yeah. Like, what I mean, it? abandoning is one of the options. You could just administer the morphine. I wouldn't, if you get blood, I wouldn't give bupivacaine, but I would give morphine. So it's, it's a bit of a pain when you're there and you've got all of your stuff set up already. You've got your bupivacaine and your morphine in the same syringe. You then have to go and draw up a bit more morphine. But, um, so when you're drawing things up, don't chuck your morphine in the bin until you know that you may not need the rest of the vial. Okay, that would probably be my best tip for that. I mean, some people would say you should abandon it, but I don't see a problem so with giving. Like yeah. Oh no, 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 no. You would, uh, you would abandon. Some people say abandon the technique and give it, use a CRI or something. Uh, carry on with your surgery. Yeah, yeah. So, as far as drugs to use, potentially you can use any spine, spinally acting analgesic, which is why I said yes earlier to using metotomidine, but it's just not very practical because it comes in a 10 mil vial. Um, but in theory, if, if the alpha 2s were made in single-use, non-preservative solutions, then yes, I would definitely use them. Lidocaine, again, very similar doses. We use 4 mg per kg. We get a rapid onset and duration of 1 to 2 hours. Lidocaine is something that I will use epidurally if, for some reason, the surgeons are being really funny and they don't want they're really worried about the dog, the way it's walking post-operatively. I say, right, I'll use lidocaine, and I guarantee there will be absolutely no motor problems when this dog comes off the table. Um, I'd be pretty confident with bupivacaine or ropivacaine that there isn't, but it would be sod's law that I promise them that the dog will have no problems and it has a problem. So, um, Something like a femoral head and neck excision, um, a lidocaine CRI. It's one of those cases where if you give really good analgesia during the surgery, they're so much more comfortable post-surgery. So. Um, femoral head and neck excision would be a great example for an epidural. Bupivacaine or levobupivacaine and ropivacaine, again, I said you kind of use them all interchangeably. One mg per kg would be the dose that I would choose. Slightly slower onset, but that's really no big deal. By the time you've done the epidural, prep the patient and they're in theatre, that's um, reasonable timing. And four to eight hours duration of action. Morphine, so 0.1 mg per kg gives you a lot longer duration of action here. So you can conv combine any of these together. So you could combine your morphine and your bupivacaine together, and equally you could combine morphine and lidocaine together. You wouldn't combine bupivacaine and ropivacaine, there's no point, but um, that gives you a really nice up to 18, 24 hour duration of action and a very comfortable patient. So as far as contraindications go, we have relative contraindications and absolute contraindications, and your relative ones will be, okay, they might make life a bit difficult. So you can see in this dog, obesity makes life a bit dis difficult. Loss of landmarks. Here you can see this bilateral sacroiliac luxation, so your landmark's going to be a bit skewed. And sometimes if you've got a fracture and one of the wings of the ilum is a lot further forwards than the other, it can be a little bit more difficult. But Loss of landmarks makes life difficult, but it's not a reason not to, to try in the first place. If you have a hypovolemic patient and you're thinking about administering a local anaesthetic, as well as blocking sensory and motor nerves, our local anaesthetics also block sympathetic nerves. And obviously those sympathetic nerves are involved in the control of, of blood vessel tone. And if we paralyze those nerves, then we lose control of our blood vessel tone. You get vasodilation in the caudal half of the animal. 
So an animal that's hypovolemic, you could make that hypovolemia worse. So in a trauma patient, I would either make sure that patient is well stabilised before they go to theatre, or you could think about using a shorter duration local anaesthetic, such as lidocaine, or you could just say, right, I'm not going to use any local at all, I'm just going to use morphine instead, because you don't get the, um, the um, paralysis of those sympathetic nerves with morphine. It's only local anaesthetics where you see the motor paralysis and the sympathetic effects, and you don't always see the sympathetic effects. Absolute contraindications would be infection over the, the site where you're going to perform the epidural, and obviously a coagulopathy because you could cause a bleed in the spinal cord that goes undetected. Some potential problems to consider with epidurals. I've already said about the, the sympathetic nervous system blockade and hypotension. Some people will advocate giving a 10 ml per kilo bolus of fluid such as Hartman's solution before or whilst you're doing the epidural to try and counteract against this um, vasodilation just to fill uh, the vasodilator space a little bit more. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We tend to monitor the blood pressure. If the blood pressure dips off the epidural, then I'll give a 10 ml per kilo bolus of fluids to try and rectify that. Um, not all that often. Um, one in ten, maybe. Hypothermia for the same reason. If we've got sympathetic nervous system blockade um, and vasodilation, uh, then we're going to lose a lot more heat. So we need to monitor the temperature of our patients having epidurals um, and potentially rectal temperature. If you've um, caused vasodilation at that end of the animal, rectal temperature might not be the best uh, monitor. Urinary retention. We can see urinary retention with opioids. You don't see this with local anaesthetics, it's just with opioids. And you can see it with systemic opioids as well, but we seem to see it a little bit more with epidurally administered, administered opioids. And that's because the opioids decrease the response of the detrusor muscle in the bladder. So the bladder is full, but the animal just doesn't know that it's got a full bladder. The way I deal with that is every single case where I perform an epidural with morphine has its bladder expressed in recover in uh, recovery before it, it recovers from anaesthesia. And then I normally find that at some point overnight those dogs pee, so um, it's, I've never had a problem where um, we've had to express a bladder halfway through the night because this is a problem. Um, there may well be surgeries that where you're performing where you might think I'm going to put a urinary catheter in anyway, so you're kind of mitigating against that right from the start. And delayed hair regrowth, just be careful if you do this in, well, I wouldn't do it on a show dog, because delayed ha hair regrowth is reported in 11% of cases, and we don't quite know why. Does take a long time. Um, yeah, one of the surgeons said, "Oh yeah, I just see these dogs after epidurals, and the 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 sight from the cruise ship's growing back, and they still got this little patch on their back, and that's all the owner says. They didn't care that my surgery was amazing." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it does happen. Um, just warm people. So intraoperatively, just like I would monitor any other. Anesthetic, um, we would be monitoring the blood pressure, reducing the volatile agent, and providing fluid therapy during the procedure um, just to mitigate against if there was going to be any um, uh, hypotension as a result of doing that epidural. Post op care for patients that have had an epidural, we would pain score them every four hours and empty the bladder prior to recovery, as I said, and monitor that they are in fact urinating. So what about direct application of morphine? We've already talked about intra-articular morphine. Um, there's a study that looked at directly placing morphine on the spinal cord during spinal surgery. And they used morphine 0.1 mg per kg in dogs undergoing a, a intervertebral disc extrusion. 
and they were able to demonstrate that the patients that received the morphine topically were a lot more comfortable um, in the 24 hours post anesthesia than the patients that didn't get it. So yes, um, spinal surgery, topical morphine, definitely a good idea. Just got another video of a femoral nerve block for you here. Little bit dark there. I'm just with my left hand and my index finger, I'm just palpating the femoral nerve there and moving the needle around. That twitch you can just see on the medial stifle, that's just a local muscle twitch. That's not, that's exactly, that's what you want to see. So if you're doing this and you're getting that local twitch, you just need to keep looking for the nerve. And that's a really nice example of the motor response that you want to see from a femoral nerve block. Turning down to current of point two, aspirating and injecting our volume of 0.1 mils per kilo. As far as the anatomy of the femoral nerve goes, this is the position of the dog here. So the dog's on its back and its limb is extended like that. This is cranial, this is caudal. Femoral nerve obviously comes from L4 to L6 comes out of those spinal roots and then it runs through the iliopsoas muscle here. This muscle has been sectioned so you've got the nerve right down the middle and that's just the iliopsoas muscle, muscle butterflied there. So when I'm performing this block I would be standing here with my left hand, this is sartorius muscle here, so palpating the top of the, the, the cranial aspect of the dog's um, femur. And down here, you've got the, this is the femoral artery here. And the nerve is just coming down here, and then it runs down with the femoral artery. So that's your landmark. Where you're actually trying to block this nerve is quite a long way inguinally. You want to block it pretty much as it exits the iliopsoas. And we can, we'll feel, there'll be some really, if there are some really nice slim dogs, which I hope there are, we can feel that in the practical, and then we can dissect down onto it. This is a CT reconstruction looking, this is looking from the ventral aspect to the dorsal aspect. So here, this purple nerve is the femoral nerve. So it's come out, that's uh, L7, L6. It's come out a little bit higher here. The nerve that comes off here is the obturator nerve. And there's now more work looking at blocking the femoral nerve a lot higher up to get the obturator. So if we do the inguinal approach, which are the two videos I've shown you so far, we're probably blocking about here. We may be missing the obturator nerve. And in some dogs, the obturator nerve contributes to innovation of the medial stifle. So it's actually really important if we're doing stifle surgery that we try and get this nerve. And so more and more people are looking at blocking up here, what's called the lumbar plexus. That nerve just running across the top and coming back here, that's the sciatic nerve. <laughs> Um, why femoral sciatic over epidural? Uh, there was a, a study from Cornell and they looked at femoral sciatic compared to epidural and they showed in the 24 hours after surgery the degree of analgesia provided by both was actually very similar and that was using a bupivacaine morphine epidural so you'd expect 18 to 24 hours of analgesia but from a bupivacaine femoral nerve block, probably six to eight hours of analgesia. So with a good nerve block, those patients were as comfortable as a patient receiving an epidural. Obviously with a femoral sciatic nerve block, you don't run any of the risks associated with urinary retention and you don't run any risks of hypotension. We've, we were part of a retrospective study and we looked at hypotension associated with patients undergoing femoral sciatic nerve block, we couldn't find um, an increased incidence of hypotension. And we're not you losing any, we're not having any, any motor effects on the other limb. So if you were a real epidural skeptic and you said, oh, they get motor blockade for hours, if you, let's say you've got a Newfoundland and there's one person at the hospital overnight trying to manage it, they can't take a Newfoundland out for a pee on their own. Whereas if you've done a femoral sciatic nerve block, the dog can at least get outside on three legs. So for your stifle and femoral fractures, what's your personal preference? I would do a lumbar, we'll come to, I do a lumbar plexus and a sciatic block for a stifle surgery and for a femoral fracture I do an epidural. Still, I still like the epidural for the, the 
duration of action for the femoral fracture. So this is a lumbar plexus block. So the next slide looks at the, the anatomy. But here, that's the dorsal iliac crest there. And we just, it's called a pre-iliac approach, this. This video is a bit grey-green, I'm afraid. So we're sinking that needle quite deep towards the lumbar plexus. And then coming out completely and redirecting if we're at first not in the right place, starting with a current of one milliamp. And we're looking for a similar response as we get with a femoral nerve block, as far as muscular contraction goes. Bit of a twitch there, there we go. Just having a little move around to try and get that a little bit more accurate. And we're at a current of 0.5 there, which for me with a lumbar plexus block is good enough to say we're in the right place, let's inject. So they only went for a long way and then quite Yeah, yeah. Can you try whatever? No, I would only do the femoral nerve block. You can do the femoral nerve block and the sciatic without a nerve stimulator, but I wouldn't try a lumbar plexus without it. And this is the anatomy here. If cranial is here and caudal is here, that's the dorsal iliac crest here. You've got the transverse process of L7, transverse process of L6. So our femoral nerves are coming out from here. You can see here and here. This is running through iliopsoas muscle down to the femoral nerve here. And so actually your needle is coming somewhere in, oh, it actually says needle here, in here. And this is the area that you're trying to block. So quite a long way in. People describe um, paravertebral approaches as well, so coming dorsally down onto that area. Just got another little sciatic video there. It's a really nice response. We'll dissect some sciatic nerves out this afternoon. You see the sciatic nerve is so contained between the greater trochanter and the pelvis that you can't really go wrong if you put a, a decent volume of local anaesthetic in there. With using nerve location, it means that we can be very accurate and we can use lower doses of local anaesthetic. If you're doing it blind, then you can just increase your volume to somewhere that's still within your safe range and you're going to um, improve your chances. There is a block called a sacral plexus block, which this is where you would traditionally block the sciatic nerve. And here's the dorsal iliac crest, and the sciatic nerve just hooks itself over the pelvis there. And you can um, use a nerve locator to block it a lot higher up. But so far, I don't really think there are any reported advantages. So I think you're better off trying the sciatic nerve block rather than a sacral plexus block.